Good morning, happy Sabbath. Welcome back to Sabbath School. We have uh, an exciting and uh, spicy segment that we are going to be looking at. The segment is Genesis 25 to Genesis 35. Okay, so 25 to 35. It is a spicy segment because it includes some very challenging episodes from the life of uh, Jacob and his family. Let us pray and then we can dive in. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning, for the renewal of your mercies in our life. And we thank you so much for each and every one that came out with a desire in their hearts to get new insights about life, life here on earth, and life eternally in your kingdom. Lord, we pray that you will bless us to the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. The story is very insightful because it follows the move that we, I think, are already aware of that can create a chiastic structure. When you see a journey one way and then a journey back, you can always ask yourself, huh, is there something special being told here? And obviously, there is something special told. And we know from chapter 30, verses 22 to 25, so 30, 22 to 25, that there is a turning point in the story after which Jacob wants to go back home. Back home? Yes. Because that's where he's coming from. He's coming from Canaan because of the complications that happened around his birth and then the way he obtained his birthright and the blessing from his brother Esau, Jacob has to leave. He has to run away. And he goes to Haran. Haran is the place where his family members, relatives of his mother, Rebecca, live. So, if you look at Genesis chapter 28, you will see that Jacob has to run away, and then he has some very interesting experiences on the way as he's running to Haran. And then he finally arrives at Haran in chapter 29. In chapter 29, he arrives at Haran. And uh, lo and behold, God makes arrangements for him to meet somebody from his own family. If you read the story, you may know that at the well, again at the well, We've seen somebody else at the well. Who was that? Isaac, not Isaac. Isaac was not there in person. It was a story with regard to Isaac's marriage, of course. 
But the guy that was at the well was Eliezer, right? So at the well, Eliezer, because of the divine orchestration of things, finds the right bride for Isaac. Now, Jacob is the guy at the well. The difference between Isaac and Jacob is that Isaac was not sent to go and get a wife from Haran. He wasn't allowed to go. Abraham told Eliezer, make sure you are not taking my son there. You are taking a wife from there for him and bring her here to Canaan. But in this story, Jacob, willingly or unwillingly, finds himself at the well. And he goes there with the blessing of his father. Remember that. Yes, the plan was devised by his mom, Rebecca, but Rebecca knows how to play her role and have Isaac bless Jacob and then send him away. So at the well, Jacob has a conversation with some people from the city, ask them if they know anybody from uh, the family of uh, Laban or Nahor, Nahor being uh, the brother of Abraham, and the son of Nahor is Bethuel, Bethuel being the father of Rebekah, and now in the story we have Laban, Laban being Rebekah's brother and the father of, who's the bride? Rachel. Rachel. So the people that Jacob has the conversation with tell him, yeah, we know, we know the family. And look, that young lady coming to the well is Rachel. And uh, the story is beautifully written out when uh, Jacob sees Rachel, he does what? What? He falls in love, but there is something very strong in the text. He kisses her. Now, we don't know what kind of kiss that was. We don't have to assume that was a, a lip-on-lip kiss, but it's a manifestation of joy, of happiness that, hey, I'm in the right place because this guy has never been there. And the distance is huge. It can be days and weeks of travel. So it's a long distance. From there, the story goes much easier. Rachel runs home, tells her family what happens, and uh, Jacob goes to the house of his, his what? Who's Laban for Jacob? Uncle. And for one month, he just stays with them, works for them. But at the end of one month, Laban tells him, hey, listen, I don't want you to just work for me for nothing. So um, I want to somehow compensate you for your work. And that comes perfectly because uh, Jacob already has something in mind as to what his compensation should be. And he says, I'm going to serve you for seven years. And then your younger daughter should be my wife. And Laban agrees. But then when the day comes, on the morning of uh, the wedding, so the wedding starts today, next day morning, when he wakes up, he realizes the young lady next to him, 
with whom he had a special kind of encounter was not Rachel, it was Leah. How that can happen, I don't know. There probably are pieces in the story that we don't know. There are pieces of information probably missing from our picture. But that's what the story says. Of course, he's frustrated because he has served seven years. But Laban is not uh, too much disturbed. He says, no worries. Give her that one week which seems to be part of um, the custom, of the tradition for wedding. And then you can take Rachel as well as a wife in advance, and you will serve seven more years, a total of 14 years. Now that is painful, but he loves Rachel. And uh, here he is, having now two wives. And then as the story progresses, instead of two wives, he will have four wives. And not only that, there is deep divisions among those segments of the family. So if you read the narrative, you come to the conclusion that poor Jacob tries to execute the wishes and desires of everybody in that family, and he hardly has any say in what is going on. He's uh, being uh, ordered, almost, to go and uh, have children with Bilha, and also with the other lady, what's the other lady's name? Zilpah. Bilha being the maid of uh, Rachel and Zilpah being the maid of Leah. Of course, the joy of a father, he has many sons. We sing that, Abraham, that Father Abraham had many sons. Well, that applies much better to Jacob. But indirectly, uh, it's Abraham's descendants. So they have children, but the favorite wife, the love of his life, cannot have children. We have all kind of fights between the two, between Rachel and Leah. But at one point, if you look at chapter 30, verse 22, there is something beautiful there. God did what? Remembered. Have we seen this before? Of course we have. It is a light motive. Things happen, things happen, and you have the impression God forgot. He doesn't care. Why doesn't He intervene? Why does God allow all this to happen to Jacob? And all of a sudden, verse 22, then God remembered Rachel and God listened to her and opened her womb. And she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. The meaning of the name Joseph is this, plus or addition. So that's why Rachel called him Joseph, because she said, the Lord shall add to me another son. And it came to pass, verse 25, when Rachel had born Joseph, that Jacob said to Laban, what did he say? 
Send me away that I may go to my own place and to my country. So this is the point when Jacob wants to go back. How many years passed between the time when he ran away and the time when he finally has the chance to go back home? So we have seven plus seven. And if you look at chapter 31, verse 38, Jacob speaking to Laban. These 20 years I have been with you. How many? 20 years. Okay? 20 years. Then we also know that when he got back, because at one point he did get back in chapter 35, verse 29 says, So Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days. And his son Esau and Jacob buried him. How old was he at that time? Verse 28. 180 years. If you have 180 right here when Jacob gets back, assuming that the passing of his father Isaac happened shortly after he got back to his house. Because the story kind of suggests that. Then 180 minus 20, we get to know how old Isaac was when Jacob had to go away. How old? One. 60 approximately. So he indeed was an old guy. He probably did not think he was going to live another 20 years until he dies because in the story of um, chapter 27 and then 28, when Isaac blesses Jacob thinking he is Esau, we have the impression he is preparing for death. He's old, he can see, he feels uh, his days are finished or close, and he wants to have everything fixed because he's ready to go. But God gives him 20 more years. Is that as an extension of grace for him to be able to see his son again? I don't know. It seems that Rebecca is gone by the time he gets back. At least she never appears again in the story. But at one point, of course, Jacob goes back. Right before going back, he has a pretty strong altercation with his uh, in-laws there. Why? Because Laban, the trickster, keeps on trying to find all kind of ways to take his wealth. God is blessing Jacob. Laban sees that. And he tries all kind of tricks to get more and more from him. Not to mention that generally or roughly speaking, he is still the servant of Laban. Yes, he has wealth, but he's not on his own. He's under Laban. At one point, he calls his wives, Leah and uh, Rachel, and tells them, look how your father has been treating me. Look what is happening to us here. And the sisters agree, let's go. Let's go back home to your country, and they leave. But what happens is, 
Laban gets to know about it because they just ran away like fugitives. And this is kind of the same story when Jacob runs away from home. He runs away first. He runs away again. Jacob is constantly on the run. He's running. He's running. He's still running. So now he's running and Laban is coming after him. At one point he catches up and uh, they have a pretty strong altercation again. Unless God had spoken to Laban before he reached Jacob, it would have gone very bad, most probably. But before Laban reaches Jacob, so Laban is running after Jacob, God intervenes and tells him, hey, watch, don't do anything wrong. Don't even say anything bad to him. So still, when they meet, they have a pretty strong discussion. But then they do a covenant and they part ways. Laban goes back. Jacob continues, but he's still running, running away from himself because now he has to confront the big problem that he ran away from. And that was who? Esau. Esau. And in the story, you will see that pretty much in the same area where in the chiastic structure he ran away because of Esau, on the other segment, section, he has to face Esau. And yes, he is going back to Esau, but he is scared. What is going now to happen? He's going to kill me. But on his way, he meets the angels of God. I believe God purposefully orchestrates that encounter for him. And yet, he is still scared. He sends emissaries to his brother, trying to find peace. And when his messenger comes back, he's being told, uh, yeah, he didn't even speak to us. Not only that, he's coming, surrounded by, what, 400 soldiers? Huh? And then he is in despair. And that's in the story when Jacob has an encounter with somebody at the river of Jabbok. An encounter with whom? Because he struggles, he fights. Throughout the night, he fights with that whom? Well, that seems to be a man. Several times in the text we are told he was a man. But then when you read on, you are told that was a special sort of man because that was God himself. And that's when from Jacob he becomes Israel. Israel. Israel can mean two things. One is victorious of God and uh, the other one is fighter of God. Somebody that fights with God and becomes victorious. After this moment, he has an encounter with Esau that is beyond comprehension. Yes, he, he still uses the same kind of uh, 
bribery language, because he also sent a big gift to his brother, but he uses the language of my Lord, his servant. You know why he had to run away? Exactly because of that language. Because when the Lord told Rebecca about the two sons that she was going to give birth, when they were playing a soccer in the womb, the Lord told Rebecca, the older will serve the younger. And Jacob knew that. And the way he tricked Esau twice kind of put himself in the position of the Lord and his brother in the position of the servant. When he goes back to meet Esau, he flips all of that around and uh, uses the words the other way around. He's the servant and Esau is the Lord. But anyways, he has this meeting with Esau, and it's a happy end. They fall upon one another's shoulders, neck, and they cry, and they make peace. And then they reach back home, where the two together bury their father Isaac. But there are some other spicy elements in the story. For instance, that story with Dina. We'll see that later on. Life is extremely complex and complicated, intricate for Jacob. But there are some interesting elements that become sort of a light motive or pattern in the story of Jacob. First of all, you have Rachel as a barren, beautiful, but barren woman. Have we had that before? Of course. Sarah was beautiful and barren. Rebecca was beautiful and barren. And now Rachel is beautiful and barren. In all three cases, they would have not conceived had God not intervened for them. Is this some sort of preparation for a miraculous birth happening later on? I think so. Because later on, a young lady, a teenager called Mary, she could not conceive because she had no intercourse with a man. But God created a miraculous birth. So although it's a different level of miracle there, I believe in the story, in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, because that's what we are having here, that's what is being created here from Abraham all the way to the birth of the Messiah, we are somehow prepared from miraculous situation to miraculous situation to somehow get this strong conviction that conception is not something that depends exclusively on the will of a men and women that have sexual intercourse. There's something much deeper happening and it is God that decides when and who will be born. Another very interesting element is this movement from Canaan Back to Canaan. Abraham was moved by God from Ur, from Mesopotamia, to Canaan. 
once he was in Canaan, Abraham moved down to Egypt, but from Egypt he moved back to Canaan, right? Then we have the story of Isaac. Isaac never goes away from Canaan. Abraham makes sure Isaac stays in Canaan. He specifically asks Eliezer not to take Isaac to Haran, but bring a wife for him there to Canaan. Then we have Jacob. Jacob moves from Canaan to Haran, but he comes back to Canaan. There's one more move down to Egypt later on, but when he dies, his son Joseph takes him and buries him where? Back in Canaan. And then you also have Joseph. Joseph is sold and is taken to Egypt. Where did Joseph die? In Egypt. Where was he buried? In Egypt and in Canaan. Because he left a will in which he specifically asked them, when you will go back to Canaan, take my bones and bury me in Canaan. What is that about? Well, this move from Canaan back to Canaan is something in which we can see our own experience being mirrored because that's the story of the entire Bible from Eden back to Eden. That is the story of each individual or spiritual walk from Canaan back to Canaan. I'm stopping here with the exposition. We just scratched the surface. This is a longer segment. I just wanted you to see how this beautiful construction comes together. In your worksheet, you have the parallels. And then next time, we'll start taking smaller pieces and build on those smaller sections and see how beautifully it is presented in the narrative. Questions? All right, thank you so much. Very interesting question. You may know in the story, and that is in chapter 30, there is that section in which Laban keeps changing the share that Jacob would receive from the flocks, and uh, Jacob keeps tricking Laban, keeps using some sort of magic, putting some sort of things in the water. He um, carefully crafts some magic rods and places them in a certain way, and as a result, his share becomes bigger and his wealthier and wealthier. What is happening there? Well, I don't know what is happening there. I don't know what kind of uh, genetic engineering Jacob is doing there. Well, let me say something that I think is involved. I believe what is happening, the fact that God keeps blessing Jacob in a vivid and striking way, using his technique, so to speak, is not necessarily Jacob's um, engineering power by which he can influence the conception of livestock, I believe it is God himself doing the magic 
Because later on, there's a section in the explanation that Jacob gives with regard to what was happening. I think it is in chapter 31, verses 8, 9, 10, 11. This explanation is given by Jacob to his wives. Let me read from uh, verse 4. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field, to his flock, and said to them, I see your father's countenance, that it is not favorable toward me as before, but the God of my father has been with me. And you know that with all my might I have served your father, yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times, but God did not allow him to hurt me. If he said thus, the speckled shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore speckled. And if he said thus, the strict shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore strict. So God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. Now verse 10. And it happened at the time when the flocks conceived that I lifted my eyes and saw in a dream. And this is, I think, something that can clarify that uh, genetic engineering that was happening at the water when Jacob was putting stuff in the water in a certain way. I lifted my eyes and I saw in a dream and behold, the rams which leaped upon the flocks were streaked, speckled, and gray-spotted. Then the angel of God spoke to me in a dream. So it's pretty, pretty deep going, saying, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift your eyes now and see all the rams which leap on the flocks are streaked, speckled, and gray spotted. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, Beth-el, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise Get out of this land and return to the land of your family. So this episode in which Jacob explains to his wives what has been going on gives me the sense that what Jacob was doing was some sort of reaction to the dream he was receiving from God. I don't know exactly how, because I don't have the details. Because I think he gives a compact version of the dream to his wives. But somehow, obviously, what he sees in dreams is applied in what he does so that God can turn things around for him and he becomes even wealthier. Yeah, if there is a scientific evidence for it, even better. I'm not sure Jacob was a scientist, but God was. So he, he could reveal things to Jacob that to this day are difficult to understand. But uh, the same principle applies here, in my view, again. I try to see God in the story, not necessarily science, but if God uses science, I'm even happier. Because that tells me that God the God of the universe, the God of science, can use science in miraculous ways or in ways that humans don't understand at the time. You, you are using a word. Let me, let me emphasize that word for the camera. The word uh, my brother uses is epigenetics. And I strongly urge you guys to go and do some research and see what epigenetic means. Because, indeed, epigenetics gives some new... This is a new branch of science. Not that it didn't exist. It is that recently humans have come back to it and tried to explore it. How decisive 
what you eat can be and how uh, whatever happens to you can determine your genes. Okay, so I'm not uh, going to go on on this here, but there are amazing things. So when uh, we were told that whatever we eat, we become, scientifically, is uh, now being proved with very strong evidence. So the question is, when uh, Jacob is being treated by Laban the way he is being treated, the trickster is being tricked by an even greater trickster. Was that God's hand coming back and teaching Jacob some stuff? I believe it is very hard to avoid answering yes. In what sense? In the sense that God is in control of every single event of the life of uh, somebody that is in God's care. Remember that before Jacob gets to Laban, he has that wonderful encounter in uh, which he sees the letter, angels, and God, the Hebrew text says, God standing right beside him and speaking to him, promising him, I will be with you, I will keep you, I will bring you back. So based on that, I see God being in charge with Jacob's life. What I believe I cannot say with certainty is that God used, actively used Laban, as in God went and somehow whispered in Laban's ears or told him in a dream or somehow told him out in the field, hey, Laban, go and make some fun of this guy, Jacob. I don't think that's the case. So I would not stretch it in that direction. As if God purposefully used Laban to bother, to hurt Jacob. But when I analyze life, my life, and to some degree your life, I can say that what uh, goes around comes around. And most often, our own character flaws, character defects, we will have to confront seeing ourselves in the way somebody else treats us. So, for a trickster, for a supplanter, being deceived and being put in a situation where somebody supplants the love of your life, because in the morning when he wakes up, instead of Rachel, he has Leah, so supplanting is happening there, and then uh, the whole array of other tricks, because that's what Jacob complains about to his wives. This is what your father has been doing to me on a constant basis for 20 years. I believe Jacob had a lot to learn. So there is some sort of divine pedagogy in it for sure. Did that change Jacob? Let me rephrase that. If you are a cheater and somebody cheats on you and then you see how it feels, does that change you? Mm, not necessarily. I believe what changed Jacob's life was not Laban, although Laban brought a lot of awareness with regard to what he was doing, with regard to his character. But the change of Jacob's life was here when he had that struggle with the stranger, with the man that was not a man, that resulted in Jacob being transformed in Israel, meaning the deceiver, the cheater, the supplanter, becomes now victorious 
because he fights with man and with God, and he overcomes. So, in other words, I don't believe God uses circumstances of life to change our character. I think He brings awareness to us with regard to our defects, but the change itself comes with or from our interaction with God, when we struggle with God, when we have that personal encounter with God, which moves the accent a little bit. Yeah, good point. So if you go back in the story, starting with chapter 11, 12, when the whole narrative of Abraham starts, it's quite obvious that in spite of um, his own defects, his own brokenness, character flaws, Abraham was a special guy, had a special relationship with God, and at one point, the text even says in chapter 15 that he trusted God and God accounted that for him as righteousness. But when it comes to Jacob, all we have seen up to this point is a very slippery, sleeky guy, very questionable character. So based on what does God do all these favors to him? <laughs> I think it applies well to him what you can read in Genesis 26, God speaking to Isaac when God says that I'm doing this because of Abraham. God tells Isaac, hey, I'm doing all this because of Abraham. It seems to me that the same applies to Jacob God is doing all of this because of Abraham. God promised something to Abraham. And God works with these human beings, Isaac, Jacob, and then some others, all the way down to the moment when the Messiah is born, with and in spite of their defects, trying to bring them in that also saving relationship with him. Because what happens in the case of Jacob here, yes, we have a lot of history, of lot of, a lot of running away from, you may say, even God. And God stops him with the letter and tells him, hey, 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 young man, I am going with you. I will keep you. I will bring you back. And in response, we'll see that next time, Jacob says, um, wow, wow, if this and this and this and God, Yahweh will be my God. Wow. And this is going to be the house of God and I will give a tithe from everything he gives me. So there is some sort of covenantal relationship that God establishes with Jacob here. Somewhere here. Right? Same area where on the other end of the chiasm we have the struggle between Jacob and that man that was not a man. God himself. So you have the story of somebody that has his defects, has his flaws, his sinfulness, but God is chasing him, so to speak. He's running away, God is chasing him, or, or God gets in his way. Hey, I'm here. Then God shows up here and tells him, I am the God of Beth El. So he shows up here. Then Jacob keeps on running from Laban, um, running uh, toward Esau, but actually away from Esau because he's scared, God shows up again. And we will see later on in chapter 35, I think, yes, chapter 35, when God tells 
Jacob, okay, go back to Bethel, or Beit El, the house of God. And then Jacob goes there and uh, raises an altar. And even before that, when he gets back from uh, Haran, there is a moment when uh, he creates an altar again and calls that place El Elohe Israel, which means God is the God of Israel. This is right here somewhere. El Elohe Israel, which means that Israel, because at that time you cannot say he was speaking about the people of Israel. No, Israel is him. He had just become Israel. So what he is saying, God is the God of, of me. He is my God. So what I'm emphasizing is that it seems that Jacob is running away and God keeps getting in his way. And uh, of course, he changes his life, his identity changes, and he becomes a different human being. And later on, we will see some new features of character in Jacob. We'll see when we get there. So we have this seven, seven years of service for Rachel. And uh, then he receives Leah as a reward. <laughs> this, is, this is pretty disturbing because for the seven years of service he did for Rachel, he got Leah. And then he did another seven years for Rachel. So you have seven and seven. You have that seven and seven again in the story of Joseph in Egypt, when there is seven years of uh, plenty, of uh, good harvest, and then seven years of nothing, of famine. And of course, you have seven all over the place. Does that seven have any kind of prophetic implication? Because then in the book of Revelation, you have sevens, all kind of sevens. Prophetic, I would not say. I don't see, at least I'm not aware at this point of anything that can be prophetic in the sense of predictive prophecy in the story of Jacob here. However, I believe the seven, this construction of seven, seven periods of time, seven years, seven weeks, seven days, the seven, all of these sevens create the background story for the book of Revelation. So when you get to the book of Revelation and you look back to the Old Testament, you can clearly see that, oh, this, this construction of seven, seven time periods is something that exists from creation when God creates seven days. And then you have all kind of manifestations of seven. And from all those sevens, which are seven time periods, it is easy to conclude in the book of Revelation that the sevens must be seven periods of time. In that sense, yes, I believe there is an influence. It creates the background story. Directly, I don't see, or more precisely, I don't know. Maybe let's pray. Lord, we pray that your spirit will continue and will deepen our understanding and each one of us will uh, get new and new insights and uh, it will be transformative to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.